it, ladies and gentlemen. I may not like it. Your king of England may not like it. But that is coming, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yes. And do you want to know something? There's not the thing that you oh, are a fact. You can look it up for yourselves and I'll finish with you if you don't believe me. It's a fact. Proved by science again and again. That the worst spreader of disease and pestilence since the brown rat spread the black death round Europe in 1492 is your budgery guard. Mr. Worcester, sure. Oh, what hell are you Again, strong? Yes, I'm in excellent health, thank you. Oh, and you? Yeah, in the pink, yes. Uh, have you seen Bingo lately? Bingo? Your nephew. Oh, Richard, no, not very recently. Since my marriage, a little coolness seems to have sprung up. Oh, sorry to hear that. A lady bit of a Excellent, thank you. Excellent. I say, you're the owner of Ocean Breeze, aren't you? Yes. My wife is interested in horse racing, so I now maintain a stable. Uh, I understand that Ocean Breeze is a uh, fancy, I believe the expression is, for a race which will take place next week at Goodwood. <laughs> Goodwood Cup, rather, yes. I've got my shoes on it for one. Now, look at them! Look at them! Drink them in, comrade! There we have two perfect examples of the class which has trodden down the poor for centuries. Yeah. Idlers, yeah. non-producers. Look at the tall, thin one with a face like a motor mascot. Has he ever done an honest day's work in his life? No. A prowler, a bloodsucker, and I bet he still owes his tailor for those trousers. Very gifted expression these fellows have, very trenchant. And the fat one, don't miss him. Do you know who that is? That's Lord Bittlesham, that's who. What has that man ever done except eat four square meals a day? I'll leave you with that thought. The last man to oppose the right of free speech I refuse to listen to vulgar abuse. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Today, comrades, on the verge of the revolution, the hour is nearly on us when we shall turn their own weapons on our capitalists. Do I know you? What, hey, buddy? Bingo! You're too bingo. I thought your uncle was going to have a fit. Look at that, Bertie. Isn't she the most wonderful girl you ever saw in your whole life? Great Scott Bingo, don't tell me you're in love again. Bert, this is the real thing. <sighs> Her name's Charlotte Robottom. Her father wants to massacre the bourgeoisie, sack Park Lane and disembowel the aristocracy. Can't say fairer than that, can you? Uh, yes, George, a couple of big gins. And uh, where did you meet this woman? <sighs> on top of a bus. I fell in love, got her address, and then a couple of days later I bought the beard and toddled round to meet the family. Why the beard? Well, on the bus, she told me about her father. And I saw that to get any footing at all, I should have to join these Red Dawn blighters. And if I did, I'd have to make speeches in the park, and, well, I might run into dozens of people I knew. Still, it's done me a lot of good with old Robottom. He thinks I'm a Bolshevist who has to go about in disguise because of the police. <laughs> Tell you what, what are you doing this afternoon? Nothing special, why? You can have us all to tea at your flat. I had promised to take them to uh, Lyon's Popular Cafe after the meeting, but uh, money's a bit of a problem these days. You, uh, know my uncle got married. Yes, yes. Hmm. Well, ever since he married, he's been spending all his money on her and economising on me. Bought a racing stable, amongst other things. You're going to Goodwood, are you? Of course. Put your last collar stud on Ocean Breeze for the Goodwood Cup. I'm going to. Can't lose. I'm going to win enough on it to marry Charlotte. Oh, by the way, about tea. Bingo, I hardly think... Well, just with the four of us. Uh... Charlotte, self, old man Robottom, and uh, Comrade Butt. Who the devil is Comrade Butt? Small, shriveled sort of a chap. Looks like a haddock with lung trouble. He's sort of semi-engaged to Charlotte at the moment. Till I came along, he was the blue-eyed boy. <laughs> oh well, must push on. You uh, don't know how I could raise 50 quid somehow, do you? Work? But, uh, no, I must think of some way. I need to uh, put at least 50 quid on Ocean Breeze. Oh well, see you later. Jeeves, I'm worried. 
sir. About Mr. Little. I won't tell you about it now, as he's bringing some friends of his along for tea this afternoon, and I want you to form your own opinion. Very good, sir. I will only say this. It concerns a young lady. One had surmised as much, sir, bearing in mind Mr. Little's propensities. Yes. I've only seen a photograph, Jeeves. It may well be that she has a heart of gold. However, the first thing that strikes one about her is that she also has a tooth of gold. Very good, sir. Now, Jeeves, about this tea. Uh, get some muffins in, will you? Yes, sir. Also some ham, jam, cakes, scrambled eggs, and about five or six wagon loads of sardines. Sardines, sir? Sardines. Well, don't look at me, Jeeves. It's not my fault. No, sir. Go oh, and Jeeves. Yes, sir? These friends of Mr. Little's are my way of being revolutionaries. I don't think you'll feel all that comfortable with the idea of me having a manservant. I understand, sir. So if we could make out that you and I are sort of, oh, well, chums, I think it might, uh, might just ease the wheels a bit. Chums, sir, yes. What a old blood relation. Hello, Bertie, you're a revolting young blot. To what do I owe the pleasure? I thought you were meant to be in the country. I am. Are you sober? There's a judge. Then listen attentively. I am supposed to be staying at Marsham Manor with Cornelia Fothergill, the novelist. Ever heard of her? Well, vaguely, as it were. She's not on my library list. No, she would be if you were a woman. She specialises in rich goo with the female trade. I'm trying to persuade her to let me have our new novel as a serial for my lady's boudoir. Well, how is the old mag? Well, the old mag's losing money about as fast as any tasteful magazine for the lady of refinement. A new serial by Cornelia Fothergill would just about save our bacon. But Cornelia's being no help whatsoever. She doesn't say no. She won't say yes. That's why you're coming down to Marsham Manor. I am? In person. What on earth for? To help me sway her. You'll exercise all your charm. Give her the old oil. Well, I don't know, old flesh and blood. I meant to be going to Goodwood. Well, Marsham in the Vale is next door to Goodwood, you chump. The starter practically waves his flag out of my bedroom window. Oh, well, that, that puts a rather different complexion on things. Yes. Beg pardon, Comrade Worcester, some persons to see you. Oh, Comrade Worcester, we've heard many stories of your exploits in the fight against capitalism. Who are these people, Bertie? Uh, well, uh, Bingo Little, you know. Do I? And this, I take it, is Mr. Robottom. Pleased to make your acquaintance, comrades. This is my daughter, Comrade Charlotte, and he's Comrade Butt. But what? <laughs> <laughs> Comrade Butt yearns for the revolution, just like you do. Comrade Worcester never yearned for anything in his life except a stone-dead cert at 100 to 1. Oh, you will have your little joke, Comrade Dahlia. <laughs> I think I'd better go. Right, right. <clears throat> I don't know what you're up to just now, Bertie, but I shall expect you at Marsham Manor tomorrow. Oh, by the way, when you get there, I've got a little something I want you to do for me. What sort of little something? I'll tell you when you get there. Just a little something to help Auntie. You'll enjoy it. Toodaloo, comrades. Lovely ham, Pop. Ham, muffins, eggs. All wrung from the bleeding lips of the starving poor. Oh, I say, please. I wonder the food doesn't turn to ashes in our mouths. Another sardine, comrade Bud? Very well but only to express solidarity with our Portuguese brothers. And why aren't you sitting down, Comrade Jeeves? The history of the revolution, Comrade Butt, is the history of putting food on the plates of the proletariat. Well said, well said, Comrade Jeeves. Never mind about well said, Comrade Robottom. He's behaving like a servant. Servant? No, 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 no. No, we, uh, we take it in turns, you see. Uh, one day I'll do the chores, and then the next day, Comrade Jeeves. Uh, it's Comrade Jeeves' day today, isn't it, old pal? Yeah, indeed it is, Comrade Sir. Um, old... Pal, chum. <clears throat> well, why don't you sit down, Comrade Jeeves, and I'll take over for a bit to show Comrade Butt how it all works. Very good, Comrade. Now, who'd like some more tea? I think you'll find it needs some more hot water, Comrade. Hot water? Right. Yes. From the kettle, Comrade Worcester, of course. Naturally, Comrade Jeeves. Uh, yes, right. Well, um, no sooner said than what's it. Huh? I'll send you some literature on the subject of the cause, Comrade Jeeves. Perhaps we shall see you at one of our little meetings. Perhaps indeed, Comrade Robot. I don't know what you've been doing to the cooker, Comrade Jeeves, but I don't seem to be able to get the gas lit. <coughs> it's electric, sir. Oh. 
There's something very fishy about these so-called friends of yours, Comrade Little. Oh, you're always suspicious of everything, Charlie Butt. I am not. But look around you. Is this the dwelling of a worker? Full-blown bourgeois decadence. That's what I call it. Go grub, though. Yeah, soon have the old hot water. Uh, we had a new cooker installed yesterday. I haven't quite got the hang of it. Uh, electric, you know. Yeah. I can't quite recall, Comrade Worcester. What was it Comrade Stalin said about socialism in that respect? Comrade, I think Comrade Butt is probably referring to Comrade Stalin's report to the Congress of Soviets in December 1920, in which he said that socialism was Soviet power plus the electrification of the whole country. Oh. Well, I must say, Jeeves, I thought you did awfully well. Where did you learn all that stuff about the revolution? It is as well to know exactly what tunes the devil is playing, sir. <laughs> now then, what about Charlotte Rowbottom? I prefer not to express an opinion, sir. Jeeves, Bingo is in love with that female. So I gather, sir, she was slapping him in the corridor. Slapping him? Yes, sir. Roguishly. Oh, Lord. Didn't realise it had quite got that far. How was Comrade Butt taking it? He struck me as extremely jealous, sir. Jeeves, this is a bit thick. Very much so, sir. Hmm. Pip-pip. Why is it, do you think, Jeeves, that the thought of the little thing my Aunt Dahlia wants me to do for her fills me with a nameless foreboding? Experience, sir? You must be Dahlia's nephew, Mr. Worcester. Yes, absolutely. How very nice of you to join us. I'm Cornelia Fothergill. How do you do? Hmm. I thought we'd put Mr. Worcester in the gate room, Denning. Very good, Mrs. Fothergill. My husband is still in his studio, Mr. Worcester. Why don't we go along and introduce you and try to get him to finish for the day? Oh, well, I'm game. Bertie! Oh, what ho, man, Little. I didn't know you were here. Mrs. Fothergill is very kindly helping me with my poetry. We're trying to persuade Madeline to favour us with a reading after dinner one night. Oh, well, that's something to look forward to. Come along, Mr. Worcester. You shouldn't have come. Oh, well. You've got to forget me, Bertie. Let the past die. Die? Yes, right. Everard's painting Lord Sidcup at the moment. Really? What colour? <laughs> I don't understand. No, no. Um, the portrait, eh? On the occasion of his elevation. Oh. This is Mrs. Travers' nephew, Everard. My husband, Mr. Worcester, Everard Fothergill. How do you do? Yes, yes, yes. Everard's father's a painter too, Mr. Worcester. You'll meet him at dinner. Ah. I say, you're a clever painting, that. You like it? I know that face, don't I? Ugly devil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks just like that fellow that I... Worcester! Ah! Oh, get... Damn it, blast it! I'm most awfully sorry. What are you doing here, Worcester? Oh, you know, this and that. Hither and yon. Ah. I say, I like your hat. It's called a coronet, Mr. Worcester. Mr. Spode is now the seventh Earl of Sidcup. Good Lord! Since the lamented death of my late uncle, the sixth Earl, I'm now touring the country, bidding farewell to my legions of the saviors of Britain. You're leaving the Black Shorts? I'm called to higher realms of government. Tomorrow I address the Marsham Parva Gannett Division. It will be a moving occasion. And that's how he came to paint Chelsea Bridge. My father-in-law's a fine painter, you know. There's paint in the blood, you see. Crikey. I trust you'll all be at the rally tomorrow to hear my friend Will never Gannett got his fine bob either. <laughs> Not many people know that. Uh, really? Uh, ah, uh, we're talking of blood. Uh, my movement uh, is dedicated to founding a new order based on fairness and equality. Uh, my the period because of a mere accident of uh, blood uh, is grossly unfair. Uh, Did you have a nasty accident, Uncle? Now, we will bring in legislation to ensure that every citizen has the same right. Uh, a dustman's son shall have the absolute, guaranteed, and inalienable right uh, uh, to become a dustman. What a clever idea. And so forth. <laughs> it will be written into the law of the land. 
And I trust that you all will be able to hear my farewell to the Gannett Division at Marsham Parva. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, I've got to uh, polish the golf clubs, you know. Comrade Butt, is it not? What? May I join you? Oh, yes, all right. You're that Jeeves, aren't you? That friend of Comrade Little. Indeed, Comrade Butt. But I don't care if you are. I speak my mind. I don't trust that Comrade Little. Indeed, Comrade. Indeed. Go and find someone, shall I? Oh, don't be silly, Bertie. You can do it. Ah. Hmm. All right. Isn't it beautiful? Well, mm, yes. Don't you think George Sand had a beneficial influence on Chopin's work? Didn't know he knew him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bertie, I'm nearly at the bottom of the page now. Get on your feet, you swine! I don't know. Now, look here. I have had to talk to you before about pestering Miss Bassett, Worcester. I shall not tell you again. Do you understand? Well, I... Miss Bassett does not welcome your attentions, Worcester. No. If I catch you just once more trying to force yourself on that poor, harmless girl, I shall tear your head off and make you carry it around in a bag. Do I make myself clear? Well, yes, no but buts, I... Worcester. Well... No wells. You will simply keep your beastly attentions to yourself. Do you understand? Well, yes. Yes, Bert. Lord shit cup to you. Lord spoke cup. Sit cup. Right, yes. Bertie. What? Come with me. You, you didn't tell me that Spode was going to be down here. Just be quiet and listen. Did you notice anything odd about Everard Fothergill at dinner? Well, he was groaning a lot. Mm, I'm not surprised. It's because of this. father painted that. He gave it to Everard's wedding present. Ah, thus saving money on the customary fish slice. Shrewd, very shrewd. No, as you can see, it's a mess. But being devoted to his father, not wanting to hurt his feelings, Everard can't have it taken down and put in the cellar, so he's stuck with it. Has to sit looking at it every time he puts on the nose bag. With what result? The food turns to ashes in his mouth. Exactly. Mm. It drives him potty. Everard's a real artist. His stuff's good. Some of it's even in the Tate. Look at that. That's one of Everard's. Oh, I like the patina. You don't even know what a patina is. Well, no, but it's, it's generally safe to say something like that when confronted with a bit of art. Cornelia wants her father-in-law's terrible picture destroyed. She'd be so grateful to anyone who accomplishes this for her, she'd be unable to refuse them anything. You're going to pinch it for me. There. I knew you'd want to help. What a dear, helpful boy he is. Oh, he looks lovely, doesn't he? Bookings were offering seven to two this morning. Oh, lovely. He's a fine animal, Lady Bittleswood. Do you like our colours, Mr. Worcester? Yellow and black stripes and a black cap. Well, as long as he doesn't think his jockey's a wasp. <laughs> <laughs> Beg pardon, my lord. A person called at the door and asked for this to be delivered to you urgent. Uh, who was this person, Watkins? Do we know? Uh, I couldn't say, my lady. A youngish person with a big beard. Good God. Uh, what is it, my dear? Our, our most dastardly threatening letter. Threatening letter? Uh, unless you leave 50 pounds under the large white stone at the back of the main stand at Goodwood, you will live to regret it. Oh, Mortimer. Oh, very, very, my dear. What ho, Uncle? Auntie? Hello, Daddy. Steve? Oh, Richard, thank heavens you can't look. Good Lord! 
Uh, when did this come? Uh, only a few moments ago. Delivered by a youngish person with a big beard. Good Lord. <laughs> you don't suppose it was the fellow you were telling me about the other day, Uncle? The, um, the one who insulted you so dreadfully at Speaker's Corner? I don't know. It could have been, I suppose. I thought as much. Did you now? This is political. Mm. Give me the fifty pounds, Uncle Mortimer. I'll deal with this. Would we to go to the police? Oh no, they'd um, they'd only hamper my investigations. Don't worry, Auntie. Bingo! Send it to us, Billy. But you did write that letter, didn't you? One of the best gents, ordinary, threatening letters I ever wrote. With the exercise of a little tact, I've managed to get what I need to put on Ocean Breeze to finance my marriage to Charlotte. By the way, what did you think of Charlotte when we had tea the other day? Well, uh... I know, man, I know. Don't try and find words. Left to speech to say. She has that effect on everybody. Oh, well. Toodaloo. I do hope Lord Seedcup won't embarrass us with his silly meeting. The man's an idiot. His mother was an idiot, too. We won't go into that, thank you, father-in-law. <laughs> Goodwood's always a big day for us, eh, Charlotte? Oh, it is, Pop, yes. I mean, 90% of them put their money on losers. Then they see the capitalist system exposed for what it really is. Capitalist hyena. Bingo and that woman are here, geez. They're certainly in the vicinity. Uh, I saw Comrade Butt at Little Ill House last night. They're two to one Ocean Breeze. Two to one Ocean Breeze. There's also right, six, six to one Ocean Breeze. Six to one Ocean Breeze. Breeze certainly looks the part, don't you think, Jeeves? I must confess, I find something disquieting in the gate, Mrs. Travers. I don't see anything wrong with it. It's not something I can put my finger on. Perhaps a certain maritime role. It brings to mind the old bookmaker's adage, walk like a sailor, run like a walrus. Apple sauce, Jeeves. Oh! Hasn't that horse got a sweet little face? The one with the jockey in pink and blue? I'm going to bet all my money on that one. Has anyone told you you're not safe to be out? There's 66 to 1. Come here, lad. 66 to 1. Who wants it? 66 to 1. No danger of Comrade Little helping here, I suppose. Do give it a rest, Charlie Butt. Comrades, comrades. I hope nobody else is holding a rally here today. Just off to put the money on. Keep your fingers crossed, darling. If Ocean Breeze wins, it's wedding bells for us. Fifty pounds on Ocean Breeze to win. Deeply troubled, Jane, by that letter we received this morning. Oh, just some crank, Morty. I should never forgive myself. It's him. Who? The man with the beard. Where? Well, I hope we've all got our little sixpences on Ocean Breeze, have we? As far as I can see, the race itself is a pure formality. Just a sort of quaint, old-world ceremony that has to be gone through before we saunter over with a wheelbarrow to collect our winnings. When I win, I'm going to take a holiday in Tahiti. What about you, Madeline, dear? No, I put five shillings on a horse called Romeo Lad. At 66 to 1, it had a sweet little face. Yes, and as I looked at him, I thought I heard a little fairy voice saying his name over and over. Goodwood Cup. And we all hope it's going to be an exciting race. 
They're coming up they're to the line and they're under start of course. Can you see And they're off! And Singapore goes straight into the lead, followed by Harry Dancer and Red Admiral. And oh Lord, the favourite notion of lead seems to be left at the start. Taking up the running now is Red Admiral and Harry Dancer. Red Admiral and Singapore. And just behind them are Silver Fox and Romeo Lang. Four old notions of lead seem to be making the middle ground now. But straddling out in front, it's still Harry Dancer. Red Admiral and Fair Wind, followed by Singapore with Silver Fox. And Romeo Lang really making a race of it. Coming up fast on Harry Dancer and Fair Wind. Red Admiral still hanging on though. And I mean to say, good lord. Did I win? Yes, dear, you won. <laughs> Isn't life glorious? This is a sad occasion. Fate has decreed that I must leave the saviors of Britain to take up the reins of the ship of state in another place. Oh, shut it. Other hands will tread the path before you that these eyes have mapped us. How do we get on? To fight for the cause. I lost everything. One of the many measures I intend to introduce into the House of Lords will be a bill widening the gauge of the British railway system by eight inches to facilitate the transportation of livestock. The dismal Jimmies will tell you that we cannot afford to replace the 27,000 miles of track necessary for the task. They have not looked at it scientifically. It will be more than paid for by the fact that sheep will be able to stand sideways. Oxford University will also be abolished. We must have progress. Get on with the meeting, I suppose. Can we with him shouting his head off? Let Richard start. He'll soon see off Spode. These men have told me that the lobe of the average Englishman is shorter, more clearly defined, and better adapted to the work that every lobe has to do than the lobes of any other race. Yeah. Hey, Spode! Comrades, we stand here united against the forces of Wall Street and the City of London. In our march towards a new Britain, we will be fearless in the face of the Bolsheviks. We stand for ownership by the proletariat of all means of uh, production and distribution. I do not believe... You don't suppose there's anything in this fairy voices business of dreams? Possibly, sir, but I received the same information as Miss Bassett from a rather spotty stable lad. Oh, I mean, you want Romeo Lab? Just a small wager, sir, to make the race interesting. Good afternoon, Lady Bittleshaw. My lord. Now, how much did you drop? Drop? On Ocean Breeze. I didn't bet on Ocean Breeze. I, I never bet. Never bet? You look dash rattled. That bearded fellow's here. I saw him. I'm just looking for Richard to get him to apprehend the picture. We shall rely on the good old English fist! Comrades, we have here today at Goodwood a perfect example of another unholy alliance. I mean the unholy alliance between the plutocratic racehorse owners and the bookies. Another alliance against the British working man. The capitalistic owner together with his chums, the bookie and the newspaper magnate would have the honest working man believe that his horse is the real goods, when the reality is that he couldn't even trot the length of the stable yard without crossing his bally legs and sitting down for a rest. <laughs> my friends, 
my friends. The Bolsheviks might appeal to your lower instincts of greed and envy. We've all lost hard-earned money today to the bookies on Ocean Breeze. But what does Lord Bittleson care? There he is, comrades. I tell you, this country won't be a fit place for honest men to live in till the blood of Lord Bittleson and his kind runs in rivers down the gutters of Park Lane! I know, Comrade Little won't mind me intervening, comrades, to tell you that our own movement is also being infiltrated by our enemies. Even in our own little band, we have the nephew of that very same Lord Bittlesham, whose name you were hooting a moment ago. Oh, Richard! Lord Bittlesham's nephew? drink too if I owned a horse like that. No, no, he's, he's, he's been in a... But when we get back to the house, I must talk to you about the painting. Painting? Sir, I had to go down to the larder. What's that you've got there? Brown paper, sir, and treacle. You know the thing that really puzzles me, Jeeves? No, sir. How the dickens did Comrade Butt get to know that Bingo was old Bittlesham's nephew? I fear I may have carelessly disclosed Mr. Little's identity to Mr. Butt in the public house, sir. Thus effectively scuppering Bingo's romance with Charlotte Robot. I fear so, sir. I understand that Miss Robottom now looks on Mr. Little as a traitor to the cause. Poor old Bingo. Yeah. Treacle, Jeeves? Yes, sir. Uh, the approved method is to cut a small square of brown paper roughly equivalent to the size of the pane of glass, smear it in treacle, what and then... What on earth are you talking about, Jeeves? Uh, the way to break a window silently, sir. Well, who wants to break a window silently? Or noisily, if it comes to that. Mrs. Travers gave me to understand that you were intending to steal a painting, sir. Oh, well, let me give you to understand this, Jeeves. I have no intention whatever of stealing any dratted painting with or without the assistance of Treacle. Very good, sir. 
Mrs. Travers will be disappointed, sir. Oh, will she? Well... Are you ready? No, I am not ready, Aunt Ellie. I am taking no part in your harebrained schemes. I don't know why you're looking like a stuck pig about it. It's right up your street. You're always pinching policemen's helmets and things. Not always. Only as an occasional treat. Anyway, pinching a painting is much easier. You just cut it out of the frame with a good sharp knife. Well, I haven't got a good sharp knife. Yes, you have. Oh, now look here.
on earth is that? It's Mr. Fothergill Sr., Aunt Dahlia. Bertie, don't tell me you messed things up again. If I might be permitted to put him down before I submit to your interrogation. But what does he want? Well, I think he wanted to ask me, not unreasonably under the circumstances, why I was in his dining room at one in the morning, covered in treacle. But you didn't tell him. No, I didn't, Aunt Dahlia. I didn't tell him that I was hell-bent on stealing his painting in order that his son might be cured of chronic dyspepsia so that his grateful daughter-in-law would then allow my aunt to publish said daughter-in-law's latest novel in her magazine for ladies of refinement. For one thing, I didn't think he'd believe me. And for another thing, he'd already fainted. He's messed it up again, Jeeves. He's as bad at this as he is at racing tips. Well, of all that dashed nerve. Bertie, you don't know what this means to me. Well, you don't know what it means to me. Call me old-fashioned, but I have a distinct antipathy to bars on the windows and eating off tin plates. You just go and get that painting, Bertie Wooster. If you think I'm going to get involved with that blasted treacle once more, you've got another thing coming. All right, Bertie. You don't have to use the treacle. Does he, Jeeves? It would lend very similitude, Mrs. Travers. He doesn't have to use the treacle, Jeeves. He doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to. Jeeves? I sent him to get some whiskey. Ah, what ho, Jeeves? I did it. Yes, sir. With soda for you, Mrs. Travers? Just a splash, Jeeves. Same for me, Jeeves. Uh, should I pour some for Mr. Fothergill, sir? It might revive him if I were to rub a little onto his lips. Well, we don't want him revived just yet, Jeeves. I say, this oil paint burns nice, isn't it? Oh, how this brings back memories of the dear old school and our girlish cocoa parties. Happy days, happy days. Cheers. <clears throat> Excuse me, madam. Uh, did I understand you to say that Mr. Fothergill Senior's name was Edward? Edward, yes. You may think of him as Eddie, if you wish. Why? <clears throat> it is merely that the painting we have here seems to be signed by Everard Fothergill, madam. I thought I should mention it. Looks like Edward to me. It's Everard. It's Edward. Everard. Bertie, you curse of the civilized world. If you've burnt the wrong picture, Cornelia will kill me. What do you mean if you? Why is it always me? It's always me, isn't it? Me. All right. Look, if you don't believe me, we'll get downstairs and have a look. see that, you blithering idiot. Well, someone's taken the other picture. <clears throat> if you'll pardon me for saying so, sir, I think I may know who that person is. Hand it over, Sidcup. Huh? How dare you burst into my room? The painting. But I don't know what you're talking about. Why should I steal Fothergill's painting? Aha! What? You said Fothergill's painting? Oh. oh. Well, I'm, 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 I'm just going to borrow it. Ah, yes, this is it, all right. Stout females, unclothed, one, in conference with doves, one. How dare you? But hold on a minute. Why should Spurge want to steal old Fothergill's painting? Yes, why did you? But I didn't. That, that, I, I wouldn't. I, I, it was nice. It would seem wiser, Lord Sidcup, to reveal the background to the picture. But I don't want to! 
Why should I? You only tell everyone. No. Oh. It's my mother. What is? Are you trying to be funny? That is the woman in the painting. Lord Sidcup's mother was for a time Mr. Edward Fothergill's model, sir. Good Lord! How could I sit in the House of Lords with that hanging over me? Well, hanging of the sideboard, actually. Well, Spoon, you've caused us a lot of bother. But you wanted the Venus expunged, La Fothergill wanted the Venus expunged, and it shall be expunged. Voila! And when she finds that due to your fat-headedness, Everard's very valuable painting has also been expunged? Ah. Yes, well, there is that. Mm. If I might be permitted to make a suggestion, madam. Yes, Jeeves? If the window were broken and both pictures removed, Mrs. Fothergill could, I think, be readily persuaded that miscreants had effected a burglarious entry and that Mr. Worcester had valiantly attempted to protect her property. She would, one feels, be grateful. I see what you mean, Jeeves. Hold on a minute, Jeeves. I don't quite see why Mrs. Fothergill should think anything of the sort. Mm, the details of the plan, sir, do demand that you be discovered lying stunned on the floor of the dining room. <laughs> ah, well, far be it for me to be a wet blanket, Jeeves, but there is a flaw to wit the fact that I am not now, nor ever intend to be, lying on the floor of the dining room stunned. You mean you won't play ball? I do, I have. Ba doing Jeeves, take this upstairs and get rid of it. Very good, madam. Oh, and break the window first, would you? Let me do it. Let me do it. <laughs> oh, oh, what a hideous monster! Who's got the taste of marble for an hideous? Very nice, Roderick. You better get to bed now. Oh. All right. <laughs> Help! Burgers! Help! Oh, where am I? Mr. Worcester's room, sir. You were taken ill. That's right. In the dining room. He... Uh, what's that? A painting, sir. Painting? What painting? What are you doing with that? Uh, a gang of international art thieves attempted to make off with it, sir. Mr. Worcester gallantly intervened to save it. What a damn fool! I hate that picture. It's the worst thing I've ever done. Oh, throw it on the fire, for God's sake. I fear I may have misjudged you. You've been positively intrepid, Mr. Worcester. Bertie has always been so brave. I'll call the police. Damn shame about Dad's painting, though. So if Everard and Cornelia hadn't politely kept saying how wonderful the old boy's painting was for all these years, the whole thing could have been cleared up in a trice. Precisely, sir. It's often the way with families, but at least it enables Mrs. Travers to purchase Mrs. Fothergill's new novel for her magazine. I don't think you're thinking of the unfortunate readers there, Jeeves. You have to take the wider view, you know. Very good, sir. Uh, if you ask me, Jeeves, art is responsible for most of the trouble in the world. It's an interesting theory, sir. Would you care to expatiate upon it? Well, as a matter of fact, no, Jeeves. No, the thought just occurred to me, you know. Thoughts do. Very good, sir. 